Hello, uh, this is the fourth in the series of uh, videos on entropy sources and the sixth in the total series. Um, and uh, we're going to look at uh, amplifying noise as a means of getting uh, entropy data and uh, racing circuits, which are another form of entropy source. Um, I'm gonna, so we're going to do two types in this video. Um, the first one we're going to look like, like look at is called an infinite noise multiplier. It also has been called a modular entropy multiplier um, because its internal stru mathematical structure is uh, equivalent to modular multiplication, um, which, if you're not familiar with that, is a type of different type of algebra in mathematics. Um, so this thing here is a, um, a USB device you can buy and it implements a, an infinite noise multiplier. Um, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. Um, but first we'll talk about successive approximation analog to digital converters. And this is a typical diagram of such a thing. Um, and what happens here is you have a, um, a voltage coming in and you hold that and you, uh, you measure whether or not you are above or below some reference voltage, which is at the start set at the halfway point between the, um, the maximum and minimum voltage that you're, you're checking. Um, and then you decide if it's a one or a zero. That one or a zero gets placed on the next bit here, which alters the reference voltage to be um, uh, within the top half or the bottom half of the range you were formerly looking at. Um, and you do it again, and then move to the left, get the next bit, put that in. And the, each time the bit that you resolve, whether it was higher or lower than the reference voltage, becomes um, part of defining the new reference voltage. Um, and you do that until you get to the end. Um, and at the end, you've got this series of bits, which is a binary representation of the voltage you were looking for. Now, uh, successful approximation ADCs, they're commonly used. There are many, uh, many chips with these in. Um, but the problem is there's a limited number of bits. You, um, as you uh, go down and down to lower and lower reference voltages or finer and finer reference voltage differences, um, the noise in the system starts to dominate. So you can only get so many bits out. So here we, we've got uh, seven bits um, and maybe you're going to uh, uh, say you wanted a 16-bit um, ADC. Um, you would find that the lower order bits were very noisy. They were not actually representing any sort of stable voltage because the noise in the system was overwhelming that uh, um, the difference between the states you're looking for. Um, now, you can probably see where this is going. Um, if we want to make an entropy source that's detecting noise, why not just keep going to the right and keep um, keep dividing and and uh, and changing the reference voltage and, um, uh, and generating more and more bits and keep going all the way. Um, and sooner or later, all those bits will be noisy. And that's just what we want, noisy bits. So uh, they're random. Um, so let's look a little bit at how this works. Um, so you start off with the full range um, from zero, v, or zero volts to Vmax. And we've got some input voltage. This is the voltage we're testing for. We're trying to measure. And you have a reference voltage that's in the middle. And you say, is the input voltage above or below the uh, the reference voltage. If it is, we'll spit out a one, and we'll then move our reference range to be in the upper half. If it had been below the reference, we would move our reference range to be in the lower half. But it's in the upper half here. Go on to the next one, and in the, ne in the next one, it's still above the reference voltage, which is halfway between the minimum and maximum of the range we're looking for. So we um, switch to searching within the upper half of that range and VREF moves to the middle of that range and now the input re voltage is below that so we spit out a zero um, and we start looking in the lower half of the previous range and it's still below it so we stick it, spit out another zero and so on. Um, now 
uh, you can see a slight problem here. Um, the voltage reference, it, the, its change, its movement gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and, uh, and so you can only do that for so long. If you do it for, say, uh, 64 um, samples, then that reference voltage wouldn't be moving anyway because it's, uh, res the resolution of the hardware would be way below 2 to the minus uh, 64. Um, there's another way we can do this. Um, so instead of moving the reference voltage, we move the input voltage. So we have our input voltage on the, on the first go-round, and we have our, our reference voltage in the middle. And instead of moving the reference voltage and the reference range, we take the input voltage and we double it if it is, oh, well, we always double it, um, but if it ends up being above the reference range, we subtract um, VREF from it, or the mid-rail point of the range we're looking at. Now, when you think about stretching by a factor of two by multiplying, um, and then the divide by two you want to do in terms of shrinking the range, the movement of the reference voltage is such that it stays exactly where it is. So we've we flipped from um, uh, changing the position of the reference and the scale of the range to keeping the scale of the range the same and the V reference the same and uh, altering the input voltage. Um, and so here we, we start with um, uh, the input is in the is in the upper half, so we spit out a one. Um, on the next go round, we um, uh, multiply. It. So so we said, oh, it was above the reference range. We um, subtract V ref from it and multiply it by two, and the and it still ends up above the reference vo voltage. So we sub subtract V ref from it, multiply it by two. And this time it ends up uh, below the reference voltage. Um, so we multiply it by two and we don't subtract VREF from it because it's below the reference voltage. Um, and it's still below, so we spit out a zero. And it's still below, so we spit out a zero. And then it, the next time around it lands above, so we subtract VREF and multiply it by two. Um, and so you'll see in each of these cases, we're getting the same value out, one, one, zero, 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 one, one. Here, one one zero 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 one one. Um, it's doing the same thing, um, but uh, this structure is more appropriate for um, uh, this business of trying to just generate more and more bits um, because your um, input comparator, your reference voltage, just stays the same. You can always multiply and subtract from a voltage. Um, within a, a, a certain range, um, when that range isn't cha changing, that's that's much easier to do. So um, we can write that up as a as an algorithm and see what happens. So we'll start with uh, we've got some value v max. Maybe it's one. In this case, it's one. Um, and then the reference voltage is v max over two, so that would be 0 0.5. And we've got some starting vo voltage, whatever it is. Um, and it's between um, uh, zero and VREF, for the sake of argument. Um, and so we multiply it by two and we subtract VREF. Uh, if, v, if V is greater than VREF, we subtract it um, and output a one, otherwise we output a zero and don't do the um, subtraction. And when you do that, you uh, so we start at uh, 0.3, 0.3, 0.395, um, and I ran this program in, um, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a program up in Python to do this. Um, and you see what we get out is a, is a fairly random sequence of bits. Um, but at the end, it goes a bit off the rails. Whoops, let's go back. It goes a bit off the rails. It's spitting out all ones. Um, and, we'll, and you see it starts going to a very high value, way outside the range. And this is a problem with this. Um, whoops, uh, wrong direction. Um, if you land outside the range 0 to 1, in this case, um, we're, we're working within that range, 
Um, so if we do the same thing again, we've got v ref is v, v max over two, but we start negative. Um, we can sh we can shrink this down to the things that actually happen. Is v less than v ref? Yes. So we will multiply it by two and output a one. Um, and so when you multiply minus 0.1 by 2, you get minus 0.2. So it's still negative. So we go around again and we multiply it by 2 and we multiply it by 2 and we multiply it by 2. We're spitting out a series of 1s and it goes, it goes um, more negative. And if it ends up being too large, you have the same problem on the other side um, of it, it, it shooting off to um, larger and larger values because the multiply is adding more uh, than the VREF can compensate, for, the VREF subtraction can compensate for. Um, so here is this um, same algorithm, but now I've added some noise into the system. Now the noise I've added, uh, I've created two noisy values um, with a normal distribution or mean of zero and standard deviation of 0 0.05. So um, about 20% of the range of uh, that we're working within from 0 to 1 um, and so when we do the multiply by 2 we are adding that noise and when we do the subtraction we are adding the other noise um, and so each time we do the multiply or the subtraction we, there's a little bit of, bit of noise being injected in the system but we've also got this bit of code here oh whoops come back this bit of code here um, which is checking that we are within range um, or checking that we're below range here um, and uh, thus we're doing a bit of range checking. If V is greater than Vmax then um, then subtract something from it and if it's less than zero then add something to it uh, and we're using Vref in this case. Um, in electronics you might just have some clamping values to um, um, some clamping diodes say to keep the voltage within a range. Um, and when we run this, we, you see we get random values out. Um, and so here we have the voltage. Here we have whether or not it's greater or less than the, um, uh, the reference voltage and uh, spitting out a, a value. Um, so we can do a circuit. Uh, this is a, a cartoon version of a circuit. We have a clock. Um, and that clock goes straight out and then it, it also goes into this circuit here which is a crossbar it's either passing the input the left input to the left output and the left output to the left on the right out the right input to the right output or it's crossing them over the right input to the left output or the left input to the right output um, so it's, it's a switch um, and then uh, capacitors here hold on to uh, the voltages. So it's, this is what's called a switched capacitor circuit. And you can do this with, um, with MOSFET transistors quite easily. Um, and then we have our multiplier here so we and the subtractor. So we have a path through the multiplier to this point. And we ha have a path through the multiplier and the subtractor, subtracting VREF um, going to here, and a multiplexer which picks between the two of them and a comparator that's saying are we um, above or below the reference voltage which is which is then going to the multiplexer to decide whether we're taking um, the next voltage to be the previous voltage multiplied by, multiplied by 2 or the previous voltage multiplied by 2 and with, with VREF subtracted. And so with the input voltage on this capacitor, the left capacitor going into the system, the, the next state voltage goes on to the output capacitor and then we switch the capacitors so the um, the next state between comes the current state and we do it again and uh, each time we clock it it switches um, and we're getting a bit out each time as the clock varies so that's a, um, a, a simple version um, now this is an example of one you can buy um, uh, it's available on SparkFun Electronics. Um, I just did a Google search for, for one of these. There have been a couple of different designs available in the market. Um, now these things, because they use linear electronics, um, they're not great for use in um, small feature size silicon. Um, 
but when you've got enough voltage range and you can use linear amplifiers easily, um, so on, say on board level electronics, this is quite an easy thing to do. Um, so this one cost me $38.95. Um, and there is a software library to go with it. Um, it is available at GitHub on github.com slash waywardgeek slash inf noise um, here. Um, and I uh, compiled and um, ran this on a system. So we'll just switch to that. And I'll switch keyboards. <coughs> Okay, so um, here. Uh, all right, so we're in this directory with um, the software which was available from GitHub. And when you compile it, it compiles to this program called InfNoise. So we can run that with the help. And you can see that we have various options, one of which is minus R to give us the raw output. So by raw, we mean the ones and zeros coming out of the circuit. The design itself um, takes that raw data and passes it through a SHA-3 entropy extraction algorithm. And we haven't done entropy extractors yet, but we will, um, which is taking some amount of raw data and squishing it down to an, into a smaller amount of high entropy data um, um, and, and it will look indistinguishable from uniform random data. Um, but we don't want that to happen. We just want to look at the raw data because we want to see how good this thing is and what, what, what's the quality of its output. And if you've got various other uh, options, it can run as it can run as a daemon. Uh, we're not going to do that. Um, we are going to do um, something like this. Now we're going to run this command in raw mode and output the resulting data to a binary file. And we're going to time how long it is. And this program likes to run um, as root, so we're going to run sudo. And we so we do that and we run this. Um, I put in my um, password, and then I happen to know that uh, we want to run this for about 25 seconds in order to get um, at least a megabyte of data out. So I've got my timer running, and I'll just hit Control C. So there's no way to ask this software to give you a fixed amount of data. Um, I'm tempted to add that feature because it's, uh, it's useful for testing. But uh, we're almost at the 25 second point. Yeah, that's my little alarm going. OK, um, and so that took us, um, let's see. Um, Mm. Oh, there we go. 27.85 seconds. Okay. Um, now we have our file a.bin that we put the data in. So let's take a look at this. We're going to run gent, which is an entropy testing algorithm that I wrote. Um, uh, We'll look at that in, in more detail in a video on software testing tools. Um, but there's an, there's an old program by John Walker called Ent, which um, uh, does entropy testing. Um, but it's not very flexible. And I uh, added some features for better data handling. And that's what Gent is. Um, so minus B for binary. Um, we give it the file. And it does some statistics over the file. And it says, well, the um, the min entropy by max occurrence, max occurrence of symbol 1 is very high, 0 0.9766. So it's almost 1. But this is just looking at how many 1s and zeros there are. This isn't a good measure of entropy. Um, the Shannon entropy, by the same count, is a bit higher, 0 0.998, because that is 9998, as um, mean entropy is a slightly more conservative estimate. Um, you can compress it a little bit when you do a compression test. Um, but here you see we are failing the chi-squared test. And that means the data has some significant bias. 
and when we look at that it's 5.081 um, and that bias is enough to be seen by the chi-squared test. Um, here though we see um, the biggest problem with this design it has quite a high negative serial correlation so minus 0 0.24 that is um, uh, saying that each time you output a bit it's more likely to be different from the previous bit than the same um, and uh, that value runs from that measure of serial correlation measures from uh, minus one to plus one um, and zero is no serial correlation positive values mean uh, output values that are um, more likely to be the same as the previous value than different and a negative value means output values are more likely to be different from the zero from the previous value than the um, than the same um, we look at the longest run of symbols of so that at some point in the file there existed six ones in a row but with negative serial correlation we expect that um, uh, longest run to be shorter than you would get in normal random data for that amount of data that we got and in fact you see the probability of the longest run being less than six in uniform random data is 0 0.00000 it's actually, actually there's a little volt a little probability there but it's so small that it runs off the end of the um, resolution of the algorithm um, and it out tells you where um, that longest run appeared in the file so we've got some basic statistics. Um, we can do a min entropy analysis. So min entropy is um, uh, the sort of more, most conservative entropy measurement. And there's a set of tools from um, uh, from NIST. So if I just if I do EA non ID and rerun that command, um, so this is running a set of min entropy tests uh, from the sp 890 b specification and um, then giving you the lowest result from that set of results from the the tests and what this is telling us is um, the entropy of the bit string is um, 0.387 which is uh, quite low now we're looking at 38-39% entropic data um, and so uh, if you were using this in a, um, uh, a random number generator that you were trying to achieve some kind of certification say to the SP800-90B specification this value is what you would get to claim you could say I have 38% min entropy um, and then you'd configure your entropy extractor to, to be tolerant of entropy that low um, and preferably with some margins so you'd set it to it'd be tolerant of entropy lower than that say 25 percent so you've got some margin between what your hardware is producing now the actual entropy is higher than this these algorithms are notorious for underestimating the entropy but that's the algorithm the government gives us uh, so uh, we have to live with it for now although i'm actively working on trying to get those tests changed um, Okay, so that's the um, uh, the modular entropy multiplier. I will move on to um, racing circuits. Now, this is quite a simple idea. You take two delay paths and you put some um, edge or pulse into the start of the delay line delay lines at the same time. And there will be some variable delay um, varying from uh, pulse to pulse with um, time because of noise in the circuits. But then also um, there will be some constant uh, delay. The mean delay through these paths will be different and uh, because when you built it, the transistors in these circuits were stronger or weaker. Um, so the part the delay through these paths is not identical on average one will always be a bit faster than the other um, and then you detect which rises first which edge rises first 
an output of 1 or a 0. Now that's quite easy to do with, say you can take a couple of flops and you would um, uh, feed a 1 into the data input and the um, this this edge would go into the um, clock input and the first one to be clocked would um, set its output to 1 but that output would go to the clear input of the other flop and the same for the other flop its output would go to the clear input of the uh, first flop and so the first one to fire would output its 1 and prevent the other uh, flop from firing um, so you can uh, see which uh, which um, flop got asserted first um, and there are other more cunning circuits for doing doing one of these race detection um, circuits uh, so you can look at uh, this and say but what if that constant offset delay is um, uh, bigger than the noisy noise based delay that's varying with time um, you're always going to have one uh, side winning over the other and that's true and it's just the same as, as when we looked at metastable sources where we have back-to-back -back inverters one of them is stronger than the other because it just so happens that it's got um, uh, a lower output resistance or a, a better VT uh, or some other transistor property making it stronger um, and so what we need to do is wrap some feedback around this circuit in order to compensate for the um, uh, the mean uh, delay being different. Um, so here's something we can do. We can look, zoom into one of the delay elements and instead of just having the delay, we can pull that delay element essentially out. So we've got delay through the delay path and a little bit of delay through the multiplexer or we've got just the delay through the multiplexer and not the delay in the de delay path. And so, and you have a control input which is saying whether or not to include that delay path or bypass it. So now we have our delay path of a set of um, cells like this, each one with a multiplexer, and when you assert any of these you will um, uh, cause that delay to be taken out of the total. Um, and so you can choose how many of these bits to assert and the more you assert the shorter the delay path and you are therefore compensating, uh, able to compensate, you would measure the number of ones and zeros coming out if you're getting too many ones you would um, shorten the uh, time through the delay path that it that was winning and if you're getting too too many zeros you'd shorten the other delay path um, and um, until until they they matched um, there's another thing you can do um, which is choose where on the delay path you're going to inject your start point um, and so here we are just passing a 1 into the multiplexer chain. So you start off with a, a 1 coming in and it propagates through the delay path if all of these multiplexers are set to the top input and, it would pa and the pulse would pass right through. Or you can set the, uh, at the start of our evaluation time, you can say, um, I'm going to assert this input, say, and it, that would mean that the um, path, delay path would start here and go um, go that, uh, just that far, bypassing these, these two. Um, so the point along the chain that you choose to do your um, injection, um, that's, uh, that's going to dictate how long the path is. And so you then have these two paths and you might start the injection point in the middle of both paths um, and move, the, move them left or right. The, the injection points um, based on uh, which side is winning more than the other um, to keep those things in balance. So that's the end of, of this. I, I was going to talk about um, some specific implementations of race circuits, but I can't because while I'm familiar with a couple of different types, they haven't been published yet. Um, and so I can't really go and uh, publish them here until they've been publicly published. Um, but uh, uh, they do exist and um, they happen to be useful in FPGAs where um, these delay elements are um, commonly um, say a, a, a macro cell in, a, in an FPGA uh, and they have a specified delay going through them and you can configure it one way or the other to be faster or slower so you can um, do 
uh, a variation of well you can do a variation of this type of circuit where there's two paths through the macro cell a faster one and a slower one um, and the output will and the macro cell includes the multiplexer um, and so you can uh, configure those things to be um, those cells to be faster or slower uh, and therefore hook your feedback up to those control inputs and um, try and keep the bias of the output the same uh, or in the middle um, so that's uh, two new types of entropy sources we looked at and the, la the end of the entropy source series um, we'll move on to um, entropy extraction next uh, the next thing in the chain is um, of a normal random number generator is going to be either uh, both an entropy extractor and an online health test um, so I could have gone to online health testers online health tests or um, entropy extractors and I've decided to go with entropy extractors first. Um, I think they are quite interesting and um, quite a change from uh, this entropy source topic. Um, so we'll look at that next. So thank you and goodbye and see you in the next video.